afternoon, everybody. And welcome, to another, welcome to another Tricky Thursday session. I am Samina Kanyari, General Manager, Junior International Nurseries. In today's Tricky Thursday session, we will explore some simple ways to cope and manage the care of your little ones. Before we address the many questions that have come our way, co-hosts in today's session with me are Carol Oliveira and Laura Patton. I'm going to hand over to Laura to answer our first question on this beautiful Tricky Thursdays afternoon. Hi everyone, welcome back to Jen's Tricky Thursdays. Today I'm going to answer some of your questions and try and be a help to all the mummies, daddies, aunties, uncles, grandmas, nannies and carers out there. If you have a question, please share with us today and we're going to try and get to all of the questions throughout this tricky Thursday hour. First question is, how can I get my child to engage in play by themselves and in play with others? So I'm going to answer this in two parts and let's first look into what is play? What are the stages of play? So first comes the solitary play. That's a child playing alone. That's a child being interested in the movements and the actions that they're doing. Then we move on to our parallel play playing alongside another child or alongside an adult perhaps, but not necessarily having the same goals or targets in mind. Then we move on to onlooker play. That's when your child is interested in the things that other families are doing or the children are doing around them. Then we get on to the stages where your child is started to be interested in the play of others. So we want our child to be interested in the play of others, but we'd also like them to play alone. If you'd like your child to play alone, we're still going to need you, mommy and daddy. We're going to need you as the facilitator. What we need you to do is provide a lot of stimulating and interesting activities or play games in your house or outside in your garden, but they need to be challenging as well as engaging. So find what your child likes, whether it's football, whether it's a fishing game, whether it's a puzzle, find their interest and passion then play some challenge, pitch the activity so it's a little bit too difficult. If an activity is challenging and stimulating and based on your child's passion, they're going to be really, really engaged. Moving on to getting your child to play with another or associative play, cooperative play, what we need to do is, mommy and daddy, we've still got to be involved. So your child will need the chance to play with peers of a similar age or younger or older. What I suggest is getting yourselves all packed and ready to go to the park or a swimming pool or even a play center. Now I know in these days in the era of COVID, we're all a little bit frightened to go near those kind of places. But what I suggest is just equip yourself, have your sanitizer, use frequent hand washing, take some sanitization wipes and go ahead. Find somewhere that you're comfortable with. So maybe you start with the park that's close to you. What you need to do is get involved in your child's play. Go into the sand pit, sit with them, communicate with the friends around, around you. You need to be the role model that facilitates the initiation. Your child needs to see, how do I make a friend? How do I get somebody to engage in play with me? Also remember in Dubai, many of the children around your child may not be speaking the same language. This barrier might frighten your child. They might think, I don't understand the other child or they don't understand me. But what you need to recognize is that play is a universal language. All children, young and old, understand the language of play. I'm offering you a toy. I'm thanking you for a toy. But as the mummy and daddy, get into the um, sand pit or go into the swimming pool. And when you're comfortable, and when you've taught your child some of the strategies of early play skills, then step back. I hope I've answered your question today. Today, we're gonna go through a series of questions and go between our panelists. Next, we're going to answer with Miss Carol. And her question is, how do I help toddlers with separation anxiety when the parents are away? This is a really, really popular question and really common within our nurseries. Miss Carol is going to help us answer that one. Take care. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. 
So to answer the question that Laura just mentioned, right? How to help toddlers with separation anxiety when parents are away. Um, first of all, I find it very important to reinforce that separation anxiety is a normal part of young children's development. It's absolutely normal and even expected for your young child to feel anxious when saying goodbye to mom or dad and even for them to cry. Now, having said this, from my experience working at nursery and as a mom of two, there are definitely some key strategies that you can use which tend to be very helpful to use um, to, to ease your child's separation anxiety altogether. So number one, do make sure that you give your child plenty of opportunities to practice being away from you. Start off with very short periods of time, even five or 10 minutes will do. Try something as simple as allowing your child to play inside um, the cot after they wake up. If they're not crying, don't, don't be tempted to rush to them. If they're not crying, let them just be, let them play for a little bit by themselves. Do also give them a chance to spend some time with other members of the family, with close friends, rather than just with one person, like always with mommy or always with daddy. Secondly, when leaving your child at nursery or with a relative or with a nanny at home when you go out, do make sure that you keep your goodbyes short and sweet. This is very important as extending the goodbyes will not help your child and it will not help you either. Do give your child your full attention when saying goodbye and in a simple way, explain to the child what will happen, what to expect. Give them a time frame that they understand. So rather than saying, mommy will be back at three o'clock, tell them mommy will be back after you wake up from your nap, for, in for, from your nap, for instance. Um, also do make sure that you keep your promise. And if you tell them that you're gonna be back at a particular time, try your very best to um, keep that promise and to, back, to be back at the time that you've mentioned that you would do, that you would do right? So this will help build your child's confidence and trust that you will return also, don't be tempted to just sneak out of the house or um, sneak out when you come to drop off your child at nursery to avoid crying. This will not help with separation anxiety. It will actually stress the child even more. I know, mommy, I know, daddy, that it, it, it can be quite stressful for us as well to um, watch our child just crying and, and having to leave them um, at nursery or having to leave them with a relative or with the nanny at home. But it's important for you to display confidence, to stay posit positive. And once you deci you've decided that you're going to step out of the house or that you're going to leave your child um, at nursery, say your goodbyes and then don't turn back. Um, if you know for a fact that for whatever reason your little one is very stressed, maybe you're going to have to shorten the time that you stay away from them, but don't be tempted to return immediately. Give them some time to calm down and to start getting used to being away from you. Okay, then once you're back together, do give your child lots of praise and that undivided attention that they need and which they love to, to get. I hope this helps. Now, um, I'm just going to have... Samina is going to answer our next question, which is definitely um, a very interesting one as well. Thank you, Carol. Uh, this question has come to us from Jeanne, and the question is, what goals must be achieved before FS1 for a kid? It is actually a question that every first-time parent asks. Even though I remember being a mom 17 years ago, whose child went to the foundation uh, 17 years ago, I, the memories clearly it etched in me. Uh, the nerves, the pressure, even the FS1, even being an FS1 teacher back then, um, well equipped with the knowledge of what I needed to do and to prep, uh, it was not easy. And I completely understand as a parent, the need to do everything right for your child and be prepared. But before I go into the details of what must be achieved prior to the start of FS1, I want to talk a bit about uh, Vygotsky's concept of potential development or the zone of proximal development, often used in classrooms, and how it can help us understand the way children can learn and master skills. The core idea behind Vygotsky's theory is that more knowledgeable person can enhance a child's learning by guiding them through a task slightly above their ability. And um, as a child becomes competent, uh, the ex uh, expert gradually stops helping until the child can perform the skills themselves. So there are two levels to a skill development. 
level A, uh, one of the levels is that a child can achieve by themselves through exploring. And the second stage of the level, a second level is that the child can achieve uh, with experience with uh, a parent, teacher or a pair itself. What is essential to know uh, as an experienced adult uh, is that you can guide your children to stimulate them, uh, provide provocations to get their attention, uh, scaffold learning by modeling, by providing examples uh, or uh, being supportive of what they really, uh, of, um, of the things that they can really make a difference with. And, um, um, and in doing so, you're, you're putting your child in the zone of proximal development. What is also very important is the social interactions that allow your child to observe and practice their skills. Uh, knowing now how children learn and that we need to support them, uh, what is important before your child uh, uh, joins FS1 uh, uh, is to get the three-year-old emotionally ready and excited about their new adventure. Uh, the more children can visualize the unknown, the more prepared they will be. It is, however, important uh, for a child to experience an element of control. As a parent, um, you uh, encourage your three-year-old to have a go at the things. Uh, give them opportunities to ask questions and uh, keep on asking questions after, after uh, question after question, question after question. On an average, the child asks about 76 questions in a day. Uh, count how many do you allow your child to ask? Um, practice the morning routines, include getting dressed, um, eating breakfast in time to leave for school. Uh, as parents, uh, we also need to provide opportunities for them to sit at a table uh, with their snack, opening their lunch boxes, getting them to tidy uh, up after themselves. Um, let them have a go at wearing their own clothes, to unbutton, to zip uh, the trousers uh, or the uniform if they are going to have one and allow changing into the costumes for water play or swimming. A mandatory requirement if your child is going to start FS1 in a school is being independent in personal hygiene. The child needs to be fully to toilet trained during the day. This is though not a requirement if you're continuing with a nursery or you're joining an FS1 in a nursery. Uh, plan a play date and help them make friends, of course. Be mindful, of course, of the health and safety protocols that we need to follow now. Uh, having uh, friends is hugely beneficial for children. Remember, uh, social interactions allow a child to observe and practice their skills. So let the adventure begin. And I hope uh, um, you are listening and are able to share with us uh, the journey uh, uh, of the journey, how the FS1 is. Um, now I'll pass over to Laura to answer another Tricky Thursday question. Hi everyone. Okay, our next question is very detailed, so I'm going to read it and share it with you. My son has started now to refuse food even before he tastes it. So we stress on him to taste it and then he likes it and eats it. But how can we handle this before stressing or forcing? Because when we don't do, we don't do this, he doesn't eat. He's so attached to me, the father, and prefers me to do everything for him than his mom. He only allows mommy to help him if I'm not around. This is a really important question, but the first thing that I'm, I can see is I can see lots of success. Daddy, it seems like you're doing an amazing job and you've really got your child to work with you. So what we need to do is identify your mood, your vibe, your actions, your gestures. What is it that's getting your son to cooperate with you? It seems like you're doing a fantastic job and mommy also. What I would ask mommy to do is join you at the meal time and just observe. Maybe mommy's busy making a cup of tea. Maybe mommy's busy folding the tea towels. As long as she's present very near the meal table. Mommy observe what is daddy specifically doing? Is there something that he's doing that makes the child more comfortable? Perhaps he's not in a hurry. Perhaps he's not thinking about the next thing that we've got to do. Maybe. Try and observe the skills and strategies that daddy's using and try and model them in other areas of the day. Then, when your child is comfortable, try and help out with your child also. It might be that daddy has to take a very important phone call just at the time that the child is eating and mommy needs to swoop in and support. What I would say is celebrate your meal times. Make them a really important day with the family. 
Now, in our busy lives, I appreciate that it's not always possible to get everybody sitting at the same time. Maybe your child's meal time is slightly earlier. Maybe mommy or daddy arrive home late, but as frequently as possible, try to eat together. It's that supportive, conducive environment that your child will feel relaxed and able to eat. Offer similar foods that's on your plate to your child. Try to ensure that you're eating the same styles of meals. Of course, mommy's or daddy's food might have a little bit more seasoning or a little bit more spice, but try to eat meals that look very similar. Think about the presentation of your child's meal. Have they ever touched that food before? Have they ever smelt that food before? If we haven't experienced the new foods, we don't necessarily want to put them into our mouths. The first experience shouldn't necessarily be the palate, it should be the hand, it should be the fork. Your child has to experiment with new tastes and new foods before they'll feel comfortable. Listening to this question, what I would say is it's really important not to stress that your child eats. I can understand as a parent that you're worried that your child might be hungry or be lacking nutrition, but something that you might want to think about is your child's stomach is the size of their fist, not yours. So our stomach is the size of our fist. Our child is the same. That's really small. So your meals should be very frequent, at least three meals throughout the day and at least two opportunities for snacking. You don't need to eat lots and small bites will be sufficient to get your child the nourishment they need. What I might suggest is not providing the water bottle at the very, very beginning of the meal. If a child drinks lots of water, their stomach starts to feel full. As a child, ordinarily, their stomachs have never been stretched. They've never eaten so, so, so much that their stomach can feel that. So they're very aware, they're acutely aware, actually, of how their stomach feels when it is full. So filling the stomach with liquid will mean that the child will feel full quicker and refuse the food. Also, think about if you're offering milk. Bottles of milk and drinking milk will also curb your child's hunger. They won't be as hungry, hungry when they're coming to the meal time. Try to ensure that your child is hungry when the meal time begins and always, always, mommy and daddy, with everything you eat, talk about it and frame it positively. Even if mushrooms, for example, are not your favorite, please enjoy them if you expect your child to enjoy them. Eat lots of healthy and nutritious meals. Try to avoid takeaway foods and processed foods, but don't also make those kind of foods a negative food. When you go out to a restaurant, let your child enjoy some of the foods that you might not enjoy in the household. Perhaps once in a week, a three-year-old could taste a French fry. It won't do them harm, but try to make sure that there's a balance within their diet. Okay, next question. We're gonna to go to Miss Carol once again. I hope I did answer your question with regards to eating. And we're going to go to Miss Carol Oh, this is a good one. Struggling with bedtime routines. I know that Miss Carol has got lots of handy tips. Let's go and see what she has to say. Hello again, everyone. So for our next question, as Laura has just mentioned, right, is uh, the question is as follows. I am struggling with my child's bedtime routine. Would having a friend for a sleepover help? To the mum or dad out there who's asked this question, you're definitely not alone. Establishing a, a bedtime routine for children tend to be a struggle for many parents. Thinking back to when my two children were younger, I can certainly relate to, to this question too. Now, if you're struggling with bedtime routine, I would not recommend having a friend for a sleepover as a solution to this problem because this will not solve the issue in the long run. It might only help for that one night. So as tricky as this might sound, consistency is key when trying to establish a good time, a bedtime routine for your child. What you have to do is decide the time in which your child is gonna to go to bed on a daily basis. And to do so, you're gonna to need to take into account how many hours of sleep they need as per their age. And then try as much as possible to stick to the same time every day, as well as to the same routine. So the routine could be um, having their dinner and then taking a bath and then um, spending some time together before going to bed. So have that fixed routine, of course, on the weekends, perhaps the routine would change slightly, but try as much as possible to, to stick to the bedtime routine and to have your child go to bed at the same time every day. So don't wait until your child is exhausted to put him or her to bed either. At times, parents tend to do that, and that doesn't help 
So it, what, what it actually does, it tends to backfire. Make sure you stick to the routine as it will be less stressful than waiting for the child to be exhausted before put, putting him or her to sleep. Something else that's also very important, around bad time, um, keep activities as calm as possible. Avoid getting your child, stimulating your child too much around bad time. And as much as possible, avoid the use of gadgets as well, such as iPads or even the TV, as research shows that it will not help with sleep. On the contrary, blue light from the gadgets will actually stimulate your child and can delay sleep. It's also a good idea, as I mentioned earlier, to reserve some time before your child's bedtime to give him or her some one-to-one -one undivided attention. Put your phone down, mommy and daddy, and spend um, some time with your child. You can perhaps read them a story, sing a song together, or engage in, in any other activity, calm activity of their choice. However, it's very important to manage your child's expectations even before you start the activity together, even before you start reading together or singing a song or playing a game. Do let them know exactly what to expect. So, for example, if you're reading a story, how many books are you going to read? Tell them that straight away. Today, we're going to read one story, then mommy or daddy will kiss you goodnight, and then it's going to, go, it's going to be time for you to sleep. Have a plan in place, stick to it, right? And be patient, stay positive, and avoid all costs turning bedtime into a battle of wills. Good luck. So for our next question, we'll go back to Samina. And she has a very nice one as well. A very nice one about baby brothers and baby sisters. Thank you, Carol. Uh, this question comes to us from Mohammed, and he's asked how to help my older child when introducing the new baby brother and build a healthy sibling bond. Firstly, congratulations, Mohammed. Not sure if the little boy is born or on its way. Uh, in both cases, getting a younger sibling is a big deal for children. How your firstborn may fare during those first few months with a new baby is an uncharted territory, but we know children adapt and their behaviors change as uh, they get more comfortable with the change. Regardless of your older child's age, make sure that he or she gets individual attention when the new baby arrives. If you're taking pictures or videos, include your older child. Have a few small gifts on hand, um, a t-shirt with his favorite character saying, um, thank you for being a big brother or sister, uh, I love you, or simply uh, a favorite toy that he or she has been waiting uh, for the baby, uh, uh, that the baby will bring. Um, research has shown also that uh, when siblings are first introduced to the feeling of big love, when a mum uh, snuggles up with both the infant and the older child on her lap, these feelings of love get transferred towards each other. Isn't that amazing? Uh, if, you get, um, uh, if you can get your older one laughing, it's all the more better because the oxytocin is released, which helps them bond even further. Discussing the baby's needs and uh, feelings with your older child is very important as well. That's one of the very good strategies that always works. Um, you could start by saying, uh, look at Adam's face. Oh, what do you think he's feeling? What can we do to help him? This especially works in reverse. Talk to the new baby um, in front of uh, the older child about his older brother's needs and emotions. Uh, you know, your brother is so sad right now. He needs an extra hug. Your brother needs time with his mommy and daddy too. Does the baby understand that? Probably no, but over a time he will. But this tremendously helps your older child feel that his needs are important as to you uh, as the baby is. Uh, we know, we also know that acknowledging feelings raises emotional quotient for everyone. Uh, what can help more is inviting and involving the older child and honoring um, his or her contribution towards the baby's, uh, towards the baby's whatever help they provide. And it always works like magic. 
oh no, why is Adam crying? You can try saying that um, if the child's name is Adam. Uh, let's go and see what we can uh, make him, uh, what can make him happy. Uh, you're right, he was hungry uh, and he stopped crying. So what, so your child really feels that he knows what he's doing. He'll start being responsible and he, and all these actions really make him con uh, you know, confident. Add in a sentence that, how do you know what baby needs? You know, so he will feel important that, oh, he's a better judge of what the child needs. Um, well, there are certain times when you would need to avoid it uh, uh, because you don't always want to do what the baby, uh, the older brother wants. Uh, while being involved with your older one uh, may not, uh, you know, uh, may not be aware of his strengths and he may push or prod or pull. As a parent, very important, especially in the beginning, is to stay calm and redirecting uh, will need to be practiced as it will take a lot of self-control, uh, but it makes a tremendous difference in helping your child uh, find constructive ways to relate to his sibling. Encouraging your child to amuse the baby is the oldest trick uh, and always works. Uh, babies love it when uh, big sibs are silly with them, you know, uh, play a little game, uh, one that begins, uh, one that makes uh, the little baby smile, laugh in response. This will in turn trigger a nurturing cycle of amusement and adoration. A lot of positive words uh, from you uh, to the older ones uh, will help you connect uh, will help connect the older one to your baby. Look, he only smiles like that when you're around. She likes when you hold her bottle. So this will uh, uh, generate positive feelings in your child for your, towards your baby. Uh, make your older child feel proud by showing, uh, by having him show the little one how he does things, such as put his socks on or brush his teeth, tidy away the toys, and he's because there he is in control and he's showing and he's being the big brother. Uh, linking your behavior to baby's needs sometimes is also the key. Explain that uh, babies are so tiny and new, uh, they don't know what to do. Uh, uh, they don't know anything like feeding, dress up or drinking water, uh, things that you as an older brother are good at. Uh, when this is emphasized, not only will the child accept the little brother, but will uh, be also proud of being an older one and will try to be more independent. Lastly, and which is very, very important, make time to do something special with each child. Bring some books and talk about the new baby. Um, there's some lovely books in the market. Uh, my favorites are uh, I'm a Big Sister or I'm a Big Brother by uh, John O'Call and um, Waiting for the Baby, the New Baby by Rachel Fuller. Try these with your older ones and see um, how, if any of these suggestions help you and let us know if they work. For our next question, I will ask Laura to answer and it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, Laura uh, is gonna answer a question about how to promote uh, speech in a 20 month old. Laura, over to you. Thank you very much. And I can see we're getting lots of shout outs and feedback while we're talking. I'd just like to say a shout out to Anuksha. Thank you very much for listening. And Mohammed, we really appreciate your support. It's great to hear you tuning in. So Mina, it was really lovely to hear about the older sibling welcoming in the new baby. It makes us all feel really warm and bubbly inside. Thank you for sharing your insights. So my question is about how to get a child talking, how to enrich language. How do I promote the speech in my 20 month old? What I'd say is the same strategy would work from a baby being born. So what you need to do is you need to talk the day. Okay. So what I'm saying to many of you parents out there, and I'm sure you can understand what I mean is talk the day, phones away. What I need you to do is be very, very present in your child's day. Of course, sometimes you need to step away to do your work. Sometimes you have to answer a phone call, but I need you to talk as much as possible. Talk about everything that you're doing throughout the day, even from when baby is newborn. Talk about the fact that you're making the bottle. Talk about the feelings you have towards the child. Give as much vocabulary towards your child as possible. Your children need to hear as many words as they can in their developing years. What I mean is that when a child hears a word, 
Later in life, they're going to say the word. When they've said the word, later in life, they're going to write the word. But if they don't hear it, this cycle cannot begin. Now, we're definitely not talking about writing with a 20-month-old, but what I need you to do is make your home a very language-rich environment. Try to speak very clearly. Try to speak in, in adult language. Try to not use baby language. We all do it, and we all say those kuchiku sounds and enhanced words. We've got doggies instead of dogs. It's okay, but try to use adult language as much as possible because what we're teaching your child is, is that you have the expectation that they will say those words, that they will use those words. Those words are for them. So talk your day from dishes to laundry, to games, to care, to comfort, to nappy change. Mommy's changing your nappy now. Mommy's using the wipes. Mommy's spraying a little water. Ooh, it feels cold. Mommy's using the lotion. Your children will begin to be familiarized with the vocabulary of things that are familiar to them. As you branch out into different conversations, there will be language that's new. One day you will need to visit the dentist. So you'll need to talk about going in the car and the journey and fastening the seatbelt and meeting the lady at the reception and opening our mouth wide. What we need to do is make sure that we give our children lots of opportunities to discuss and talk. And what I would say is celebrate your home language. So if, for example, mommy speaks Greek and daddy might speak Spanish, speak those languages. If you would like your child to learn English, then nursery or an educational setting is the best place for them to do so. Learning your home language is that point of connection between you and your child, and it will give richness to your family. We want our children to learn our home languages and continue, continue with tradition and with heritage. But we also want them to learn additional languages so their exciting journey in our world is rich, inviting, and also they have the confidence to speak to others around them. Your child might be learning three, four, even five languages as they progress in their years, but children are language sponges. So I assure you, if you talk lots and lots clearly and add new vocabulary in each day, your child will be learning language. They might be in an, in an absorption phase. So you might be talking lots and lots and not receiving any responses, but you'll notice that they're looking at you. They're watching your mouth, they're watching your lips, they're watching your facial expression. Allow them that absorption phase. Allow them to listen to the words that the people around them, the carers around them are using and wait. When they reproduce, they'll reproduce the words with confidence. If you're worried about your child's language development and they aren't talking or using any words by the time they're 20 months, speak to one of your nursery practitioners, your teachers or teaching assistants, or talk to us here at Tricky Thursdays. We'd love to help you individually. And if you would like to reach out to any of our panelists today, you can add your question and leave an email address and we can be in contact with you further. Take care and let's go to our next question. Today, we're gonna to go back to Carol. Carol's talking about colicky babies. Mommy and daddy, I feel for you if this is you. Carol's going to help. Hello again, everyone. So the next question, as Laura has just mentioned, is how can I develop a routine with my colicky baby? This is definitely a tricky question. Having a colicky baby can be very stressful for parents, and it certainly tends to make establishing a routine for your baby much harder. Nonetheless, trying to create and sticking to a routine is definitely one of the best ways to make this period of time, the time in which babies have colic, less difficult for the parents and for the child too. Routines can help the parents better identify the baby's needs and what he or she is trying to tell you um, when they're crying rather than always assuming that the baby is colicky. So now, how to go about establishing a routine for a colicky baby? Establishing a routine for colicky babies is very much like establishing a routine for babies with no colic, but there are a few important things that you can do to make establishing and sticking to the routine easier for your baby. First of all, and most importantly, whenever possible, try to arrange the baby's schedule in a way that will allow him or her to eat after nap time rather than before sleeping. This is meant to give your little one enough time to digest um, the food, to digest the milk before lying down and going to sleep. 
Consequently, it should reduce the colic, it should re reduce the, the reflux and the pain that they tend to feel and allow them to sleep better and to stick to the sleeping routine that you are trying to establish for them. To help with the colic and with the routine, I would also advise you to try and feed your baby slower and more frequently and give them some time standing, right? So you'd be holding them up um, right after they eat rather than putting them down um, to sleep um, or lying them down um, right after they, they finish eating. Feeding too much or too fast can also increase the colic and this would definitely disturb the baby's routine. Another tip is to make sure that your baby gets um, to nap enough, to sleep enough during the day. At this young age, babies need plenty of rest and not doing so can actually make them crank crankier and even harder to deal with when colicky. So do make sure your baby has enough naps as part of his or her routine, setting up a relaxing, um, quiet environment for them to rest at regular times during the day based on his or her needs can also help a lot. And last but not least, I would also suggest that you keep a diary, that you take notes on a daily basis related to the routine that you have been trying to establish with, a, with your baby. This will help you better identify what works and doesn't work for your colicky baby so that um, you can then make any necessary changes to his or her daily schedule and learn how to respond consistently to what your baby um, is trying to tell you during the day. Okay, and that's it for the, the colicky baby question. Now we're gonna go back to Samina and she's going to talk about um, the different curricula that the schools offer. Thank you, Carol. Uh, this question is so important because uh, the choices are mind boggling for parents. Uh, and it has come to us from Ahmed. Ahmed has asked, what is the difference among various curricula that the schools offer, American, British, or IB, and which one is better? UAE is a melting pot of what best education has to offer. Statistics for UAE shows that there are 55 curriculums offered in various schools. The major ones are British, American, IB, and Indian. If these four don't feel right for you, look deeper. There are plenty options available. But before you start looking into various options, it is very important to know uh, your child and to know how they learn. Uh, do they need a structured environment? Uh, are they more creative? Are they very academic? Knowing your child will help you pinpoint a curriculum and a school that best suits and will meet their needs. Agreed, it is hard to know your child, uh, your children's style at such a young age of three or four, but something will stand out for you to know. Another important factor to base your curriculum decision is on how long you plan to stay in UAE and where you're planning to send your child to university. I know this may seem many, many moons away, but it's important to know that colleges and universities have different requirements in different countries. Ultimately, um, looking, ultimately, what you should really look is how your children will be challenged, positively engaged in their learning. And that's the key in finding the school and the curriculum. Each curriculum has its own key strengths that have been built over the years. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the three curriculums and uh, give you a bit of an uh, interesting insight into what differentiates them. Uh, the American curriculum focuses on helping students discover their aptitude and make the most of their talent. It places emphasis on creativity and social interaction and is designed to prepare students for college and careers. The curriculum does not lock, lock children into a system that, will, that they will need to follow uh, from, uh, grade, um, from uh, to up to grade 10 or 11. Students are encouraged uh, to study a broad range of subjects to the university level, and um, it is less geared towards in-depth study. Uh, definitely the importance is given to personal development of the child. However, there is no standardized core curriculum monitoring uh, with no set standards. The quality of education can vary, um, and it can vary, and even among few American schools to be found in, Dubai, in UAE. 
Uh, American curriculum uh, is uh, focused on uh, constant assessment throughout the year. And the curriculum has an elementary school, which is pre-K to grade six, and a middle school uh, from grade seven to eight, and a high school from nine to 12. On reaching grades 11 and 12, the students uh, follow advanced placement courses. Uh, the British curriculum is uh, student-centered, broad-reaching, and well-balanced. It is intended to prepare students for their future workplaces. Uh, they stress on creativity, critical thinking, flexibility. The curriculum ensures that students reach their full potential. Students are encouraged to think for themselves, for opinions, uh, form opinions, um, relate to others and gain experiences in taking responsibility for their own actions and decisions. Uh, the British curriculum is divided into number of year blocks, uh, which are called stages, key stages, um, as well as uh, early years foundation stage, which covers preschoolers, nursery and reception years, three to five years is part of that. The key stage one is uh, for five to seven year olds. The key stage two is for seven to 11 year olds. And the key stage three is for um, 11 to 14 year olds. Uh, key stage four is for 14 to 16 year olds. Uh, GCSE and IGCSE and A-level qualifications are internationally recognized and respected and are acceptable, uh, accepted at um, majority of the universities worldwide because British curriculum is strictly regulated education system. International baccalaureate. Um, the curriculum encourages students to take active approach in learning uh, with teamwork and other personal skills um, included in studies. The complete IB program runs from FS1, uh, three years old, through to sixth form. Um, it's, it's divided into three parts. The primary year program, which is also called PYP, is from three to 11 years of age and offers an integrated cur curriculum, enabling children to learn through guided exploration and structured inquiry. Um, the middle years program uh, is called MYP. Um, it is from 11 years to 16 years. Children uh, are um, encouraged to take an active approach to learning, uh, taking part in team projects that require them to use skills from a very early age, uh, such as public speaking and putting together presentations. A diploma program called the DP is from 16 to 18 years, uh, and it focuses on developing potential skills that students will require for life after school, rather than just academic achievements. However, students uh, are, um, uh, have to prove that they can keep the workload. Uh, apparently, the workload in the DP program uh, is uh, quite high. Uh, while some features are unique to the individual curricula, uh, it is important uh, um, to know and um, that the schools following any curriculum in UAE have to align themselves with the requirement of national expectations assigned by the local governing bodies such as KHDA, ADEC or SBEA. Um, more schools nowadays have uh, a renewed focus on aspects such as tolerance, well-being and happiness. Um, so they all aim to uh, ensure that the development of an individual is well-rounded. Uh, therefore, I would say it would be safe to say that all those schools follow a particular curriculum. All the schools in UAE uh, have now newfound common ground uh, in that to ensure the holistic development of a child, thereby preparing them for life. So the best thing to do is to tour the schools with different curricula and talk to the registrar or a member of their senior leadership team. Uh, I hope, Ahmed, this helps you understand the three curriculums. Uh, but like I said before, the options are innumerable. 55 different curriculas are being offered in UAE. Uh, I hope you find the right one that suits your child's needs. Uh, and I have answered your question. The next question uh, I would like to ask Laura, oh, this is a very interesting one to answer. It says, um, it's about uh, the battlefields. I mean, who's the parent here and who's the child? And I will let Laura ask, answer that part of the question. Laura, over to you. 
Thank you, Samina. Wow, 55 different curricula on, on offer for you. And perhaps your child is only two or three years old. That's a lot to think about. Thank you, Samina, for your insight and wisdom. We really appreciate you sharing with us. And because of your experiences with your children, you are the most amazing person to answer for us. Okay, so my next question says, my child simply does not listen. It's always a battle of wills. What can I do to get him to follow what I have to say? It always ends in a tantrum. Okay, the first thing I'd like to say is listening and following are two different things. So we always want our child to listen and we often say they're not listening. But many times, numerous times, they are listening. Listening and doing are completely different actions. So what I'd like you to do is put yourself into the child's shoes first. Listen. The child's got to listen to what the adult is saying. Then they've got to process what the adult is saying. Many of the words they're familiar with, but some they might not be familiar with. Once they've processed, they need to internalize what is their action going to be. Now they might not rationalize any of it, your children are so little, it's going to take them a long time to learn rationalization. What they'll do is they will likely draw from previous experiences. So imagine your husband says to you, I've booked a dinner table, a reservation at this lovely restaurant we've been before and it's called, I don't know, Blue Boat. And the first thing that you do is go, mm, because you're remembering. And you go, no, oh, I don't, I don't really fancy your thinking. The AC was too cold last time you were in that restaurant and they forgot to deliver your cutlery and you had to ask twice. Your child is the same. They will react on previous experiences. So if they've had an uncomfortable feeling whilst brushing their teeth, that's what they remember. When you ask them to please help with tidying and they didn't really want to tidy because they saw that their sibling was over in the corner of the room watching Paw Patrol. They're drawing on the previous experiences. So what we first need to do is try ourselves to be the expert listener, the expert observer. Okay, so your child is having a tantrum about something that's happened in your home. You need to decide, is there any flexibility in what's happening? So try to understand what the child wants and needs. Perhaps they're saying that they don't want to tidy because they want to go and watch the Paw Patrol with their brother. Internalize that the child is understanding what you've said. They are listening, but they're having a different reaction. Why not offer to do it together? Try and meet your child in the middle and offer some flexibility in what the task is. Now, some of the tasks or some of the things that you ask your child, they're there won't be any flexibility. For example, when crossing the road, your child has to hold your hand and must hold, the, hold your hand. So this is one that you'll have to talk to your child, explain the reason and explain that you're keeping them safe. Take a firm but safe grip holding their hand and slowly get across the road. Practice on quieter streets or practice in your neighborhood. So examples like that are non-negotiable. We must hold hands when crossing the road. But with tidying, perhaps they don't need to do it themselves. Perhaps you could be helping them. Perhaps big brother who is watching on his iPad could press pause and come and help a little. We need to understand where the tantrum is coming from. And the best thing you can do is remove some of the triggers. So in the evening time, if you've allowed your child to play a little bit more, you need to put the things that are coming next for them. So make sure that they can see that dinner is being prepared or the toothbrush is ready for them, but hide the television remote because you might not want them to be watching in the evening time. Remove the triggers and things that you know will cause a tantrum and try deeply to listen to your child. Best, the best advice I can give you is try to not think that your child can rationalize every situation because they can't and they're not, they don't have the capacity yet to do that. Their mental cognition is developing, so you need to guide them and support them with experiences. And once they've had enough positive experiences, positive experiences with you asking them to do something and a good result has come, they'll be more inclined to cooperate with you and not offer or present the tantrum. Remember, mommy and daddy are the best listeners and observers, and your child is developing and learning. 
they listen, they absorb some of what you've said, they'll partially process and then react. It's a very sophisticated pattern if you want them to process everything, form a rationalized opinion and then respond. Think about yourself perhaps in, in terms of a family argument with a sibling. Do you always react exactly how you want to? Do you always give your best response? Or sometimes before rationalizing, do we offer an opinion or an answer? Think about your child's needs and think about their stage of development and try to offer them more leniency and lots more time and lots more patience. We're gonna go back to Miss Carol now and she's got, oh, she's got a great question and it's about tipping things over. Carol, can you help us please? Thank you, Laura, that was very interesting. So the next question is, my child just tips over everything. How can I stop him from doing that? Although it's not uncommon for young children to fall and tip over things, if it happens way too often, parents do tend to get concerned. Now, I'm not sure how old this child is exactly, but I'll just assume that we are referring to a young child to a nursery age child. In this case, the best way to support the child and gradually um, have him or her stop falling and tipping over things so frequently is to help them further develop their spatial awareness, which is their understanding of where their body is in space in relation to objects and other people. So how can we do this? Children start developing spatial awareness at a very, um, very early in their lives, but for those who are struggling, there are lots of activities, very simple activities that parents can do at home to promote spatial awareness. Number one, do make sure that you give your child plenty of opportunities to freely explore their surroundings and move around. Encourage them to move in various different ways, make a game out of it. So encourage them to crawl, to jump, to hop, to walk forwards, to walk backwards, to move fast and move slow. Avoid keeping your child on the stroller or high chair for very long periods of time as this will limit their, their movement and might consequently delay the development of their spatial awareness. Another idea is to create simple obstacle courses at home, which will also give your child a chance to move around objects and in different directions. So, for example, you can let them uh, make it a special game and let them crawl under the table, climb up and down stairs, jump over pillows, um, which you've um, set on the floor or zigzag their way through the pillows. Be as creative as possible. If you have a two-year-old at home or a three-year-old at home, I'm sure he or she will love to create these obstacle courses along with you. Fun activities, which can also be done as a family, such as playing tag, playing hide and seek, throwing and catching balls, singing action songs, um, the very popular action songs like head, shoulders, knees and toes, the wheels on the bus are also great to develop spatial awareness. And you can also look at introducing calmer activities like stacking blocks, making puzzles and playing with blocks. And because they can also help develop spatial awareness as children develop a better understanding of how things fit together and are and become overall more aware of space. I hope this helps. Um, we're gonna go back to Samina now, who is going to talk about what is the right age to introduce books and start reading with a child. Carol, wow, a lot of trips, uh, uh, tips to help uh, children not to tip everything. Thank you for that. Uh, and I'm sure those uh, that advice is going to be very helpful and some very practical advice in there and some uh, lovely activities that you and everyone else can do at home with their children. Uh, my question comes from Monica and she has asked, what is the right age to introduce books uh, and start reading with a child? Mm. Uh, well, this is a very interesting one and there's lots to say about this one. Um, well, in my opinion, it's never too early to start enjoying uh, books with your little one. Uh, when you read to children, they get, they're getting full attention and that's what they really, really love and want. So reading at a younger age is a great way to immerse children in sounds and rhythm of speech, which is crucial for, your, for their language development later. The brain is not uh, naturally hardwired to read in the way it is a wire to speak or listen. 
Uh, being able to read um, is a process that begins with infants playing with or even chewing on their uh, you know, board books or being uh, read to by a parent and continues through the uh, uh, independent reading stage into school or uh, um, earlier in FS1, uh, where children are a need to be taught and how to make sense of all the squiggles on the paper. I'm going to talk about how reading uh, can be supported from birth to three at different areas and, and different age groups. Uh, uh, beginning with birth to six months, uh, the infant's vision is still developing. Um, it's best to choose books uh, with little or uh, no text at all or, and big and contrasting pictures. Interactive books with puppets, um, mirrors, and people is highly, highly recommended. Um, being read helps children see and hear what is around at that age and respond in kind. You always see a child will respond with a smile or, you know, with wide open eyes and listening to you intently. Uh, from seven to 12 months, uh, babies may begin to grasp some of the words that are being read to them like mommy, milk, bottle, cat, and halfway to their first birthday, it's best to read books with one object or items uh, the baby likes or is familiar with, as this helps the baby realize uh, that illustrations, that the pictures that they see on the books stand for real things. The best practice um, you know, uh, as, a, uh, as a mom or a dad, uh, to read uh, is to use expressions, gestures, uh, uh, reading with your face, making those interesting faces, uh, hands and voices. This will help your child interact sooner or later, babble back to you in return. And that is absolutely an amazing pleasure to see when you're interacting a conversation with a child, when you're reading to them. This conversation really helps them learn to take turns and teaches them about focusing on the same thing as someone else. From 13 to 14 months, uh, start introducing uh, books with sentences, uh, a sentence or two on a page. But note that uh, if uh, the sillier you are while acting out the story, the better. Invite participation you know, of your children by asking questions such as, what does this dog say? Or do you see the cat? Um, ask babies or, you know, uh, to uh, point to the real life example uh, of what uh, the picture is about. I mean, you can start by saying, where's your nose or where's your nose or where's your eyes? Uh, you know, so uh, and you see them that they, they point to it. A 15 to 18 month old baby uh, may answer questions with a word or give um, uh, and give him opportunities uh, when you're reading to them and ask questions. You really do not have to follow what is written on the book. Um, what's that? Even before you start reading it, uh, ask questions like, and if she can answer you, uh, that's an opportunity for you to boost her vocabulary by expanding on her thought. Yes, that's right, car, that's a big green car. So you're giving her more words, you're giving him more words uh, and ex extending his vocab. Many toddlers find that uh, familiar routines of reading reassuring and calming, especially before bedtimes or uh, late in the afternoons. Uh, the same goes for familiar books. Um, starting 18 months, you will see that children will want the same book over and over and over again. And because familiarity and routine are key at this age, you know why they won't let you even change uh, reading performance uh, by even a single meow or extra or a room not going being in place. Uh, this uh, repetition actually has a benefit for a child. It helps them make sense and then remember new words. So next time your toddler brings the book 100th time, you know how to react. The 24 to 36 month old children um, know the words have meanings and, uh, and are used for different reasons. They're well aware of uh, their vocabulary is quite extended. Uh, start, uh, they start to point and name common pictures in the books. Children at this age are, enjoy rhyming books and have uh, favorite books that you can read over and over again to them. Most of the three-year-olds uh, would have developed a 
uh, have developed uh, listening skills and would repeat phrases um, of for the words that are in the book. Uh, the children at this age also like to sit alone and look at books. So if your toddler is not coming to you with the books, it's fine because that's they're trying to explore books on their own. Uh, they know uh, that, uh, you know, to turn page and every page has some squiggles, has some pictures that mean something. Uh, and they would be just, you know, trying to pretend to copy an adult and read themselves. No, they know that uh, the book has a front and a back and to hold the book the right side. Uh, and slowly these skills will develop as you expose your children to books. Um, give them different kinds of books with soft back, hard back, um, broad books, uh, uh, big books, small books, tiny miniature books. Give them an opportunity to explore different kinds of materials in books. I would say reading is one addiction that I believe we need to encourage well before baby's first birthday. Uh, I hope I've answered you uh, and helped you uh, to understand how you can help um, your child, uh, whatever age they are, to help and read and explore different uh, books. Uh, our next question is uh, for Laura, and it is a very interesting one. It is about introducing uh, a ba um, it is uh, a mom is uh, wanting to make a home a safe place and I think Laura is the best mom to ask this question because I know she's got a little one and I'm sure she's uh, foolproofed her space uh, at home over to you Laura thank you Samina you're right so when the baby came or when the baby was coming it was time for me to think seriously my husband and I were alone in the house and we didn't have to think about baby gates and we didn't really think about first aid kits. But when the baby comes or when the baby is coming, it's time to make sure you're prepared. So lots of tips I could give you, and I'm going to list a few of them. Perhaps you'd like to take a pen and paper. The first thing is, now it might sound straightforward, please know where your fire extinguishers are. Where are they in your house? Where is the fire blanket for your kitchen? How is a fire blanket used? Which of the fire extinguishers should we use on an electrical fire or on a fire in your kitchen. Knowing that and knowing how to use a fire extinguisher will help you act quickly in a small emergency situation. I'm not asking you to put out large fires. In those instances, of course, you should evacuate immediately. But being able to protect yourself and act quickly and rationally will support you and your child or your baby, and in fact, your entire family. The next thing is you need a full first aid kit. You can look on the internet and Google and research what should be inside there. But basic items would be items such as an antiseptic cream, gauze, swadding. You might find inside there scissors. You might find inside there creams for burns, creams for insect bites, band-aids, different, the different types of bandages. Lots of things would be inside there, but best to do your research. Saying that, you also might want to enroll yourself into a first aid course. And if you have a nanny at home, you might both want to look at doing a first aid course. It's something really valuable that before baby is born, yourself, your husband, your, your family around you know how to react in an emergency situation. Many of those first aid companies also sell the first aid kits. They would give you exactly what should be inside. Please buy a full first aid kit from a reputable source. Your pharmacy can provide you one. You would need the medium sized one. So they'll give you three to four options, but a medium sized one would be sufficient for a small home. Next thing I would like you to think about is an ice pack. Where should the ice pack be? It shouldn't be inside the first aid kit. It should be ready inside the freezer. Now this might seem very obvious, but it's something that we forget because as adults, before a baby enters our home, we don't usually use the ice pack. We might bump ourselves, say ouch, and then move on. So what we need to think about is that we're reacting to an emergency or an accident. And when it is our baby or our child, our emotions sometimes try to get the better of us. So let's put that ice pack where it should be. And perhaps we might want to have two. Very often you can find heating and cooling packs as the same thing. So you might want to keep one for warming in case perhaps yourself or your husband need it for back trouble or a muscular pain, but the ice pack should be ready inside your freezer, ready to use. 
Always remember to place a small cloth, for example, a tea towel or some linen between the child's skin or your skin and the ice pack. So we've talked about the fire extinguisher. We've talked about the first aid kit. Next is also your baby proofing. You don't want baby to open the cupboards in your home. You might have cupboards with liquids or detergents. So the clasps that we put across the cupboard are very important. At the edges of your tables, you might want to put corner cover guards because a, a new toddler might bump their heads or bump parts of their body on your tables and also baby gates. You, there, are, there will be parts of your home or your staircase that you might not be ready for baby or a young child to access but you know that they will start to climb and they will be interested. So protect the top of your stairs and the bottom of your stairs and even access to your kitchen, okay? Something you might like to think about is plants. Your home might be filled with different kinds of plants, but are they safe? If a baby pulls a leaf or at that moment when you've turned your eye for one or two seconds, is that plant safe for a child to touch? I wouldn't recommend having any kind of cactus in the home as the spines can be very, very aggressively irritating to a child. I would also like you to think about pets in the home. Maybe you have a family dog or a family cat. What you might want to think about is ensuring that your dog or your cat or your family pet does not use certain areas of the house or the home. Of course, you might want to expose your child to the pet as, as they're developing and as they're growing, but when they're a newborn, their immune system and their body will react very extremely to something that you might not. Pet hair might aggravate a baby's breathing or aggravate the baby's skin. So be careful to teach your dog or your cat to not sit in certain areas of your home, or you might like to close off the baby's room completely in the first few weeks and months of, of them coming into your home. You've got to think about all of these things with a new sense of a new sense of understanding and also in terms of the fact that you might be panicking. So it might be yourself or it might be your nanny. So what I suggest is you as a family decide who is the person that reacts the most strongly and the most rationally and name them as the person who would report if you needed some help, perhaps in an instance, in an emergency, from the emergency services. Think about that these situations will be new and they will trouble you and they might feel scary. So one person has to be the strong person to react sensibly. What I suggest is have your emergency numbers listed somewhere in large font that you can see and use. So put the fire brigade, put the police, put the ambulance, put the mummy's number, daddy's number. In an instance, for example, when your nanny is looking after baby and something happens and they're worried and they would like your response, they need to access your mobile number quickly. And remember, in those situations, we often do feel panicked. So we need to have a strong list and item of protocol to follow. What I would suggest is you also list down in somewhere very visible the hospital that you would like to visit. So for example, something happened to you or your family, which hospital would you like to be taken to? It might be one that's familiar with you and that they have your records on file. I'd just like to make you feel comfortable. And in this message, mummies and daddies, I don't want you to feel scared. What I want you to feel is empowered. That if something happened to you or your family, you could react promptly and you could react responsibly. So you wouldn't worry, you would do the right thing to help keep you and your family safe. Think about all these things and ways of making your family home safe. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. You can call our nurseries, you can send us an email, or you can add your question to be answered in the next Tricky Thursdays. Let's go across to Miss Carol, and she has a really good question, and it's about attachment and security for, for the child. Let's find out what she has to say. Over to you, Carol. Thank you, Laura. Hello again, everyone. So I'm just going to read this question. It's um, a bit long, so I'll just read through it. So it says, my 2.5-year-old girl is extremely attached to me. It's been more than just a phase now. She can't do anything without me. I tried explaining to her each time I leave the room and praise her after I come back, give her, undiv give her undivided dad and her time, um, 
yet if she she always makes sure to check if I'm around. I'm nine months pregnant, so just trying to find any possible solution or method I can apply. Dear Janina, thank you so much for your question, which once again refers to the separation anxiety, which I had talked about earlier. So as mentioned, um, separation anxiety tends to be very common at young age. We see this all the time when children join nursery school, and it's certainly a normal part of young children's development. However, especially since last year, um, due of course to the COVID-19 pandemic, many children started spending even more time at home with their parents and consequently some have become even more attached to their main carers, um, not wanting to be away from them, not even for a minute, and at times even um, be becoming a bit scared of other people. So in such cases, when you can clearly see that the child is extremely scared of others, or extremely attached to mom or dad. My suggestion might sound really obvious, but it's definitely the best way to go about. Be patient. Continue to give your child plenty of opportunities to be with others, like with dad, even if it's for very short periods of time, while we take a, a very long and relaxing shower, for instance, and then gradually extend the time that they spend together. As children learn through play, and we talk about this all the time at Jin's, you can even turn this experience of being away um, from mommy into a game to make it less scary um, and less stressful for, for your little girl. So for instance, you can play hide and seek with her and another member of the family. So mom would hide and nanny, grandma or dad um, would have to look for mommy. And at the end, once you she finds you, then you can give her that big hug the famous peekaboo peek game, which we tend to play with even with very young babies, can also gradually start preparing uh, a young child for having mom and dad out of sight. Role playing can also be very helpful in supporting children and helping them make sense of um, certain situations and coping with being away from mom. So play with your child, take time to play with them. And while playing, create scenarios that involve um, the doll being away from mommy, and or the stuffed the, the, the stuffed toy being away from mommy and do make sure that at the end mom and doll stuffed toy and mommy stuffed toy uh, toy are always reunited at the end lastly there are also some very nice storybooks on this topic which you can read to your child that might help um, might help her start coping a, a little bit better with being away from you my two favorite ones are the kissing hand by Audrey Penn and the invisible string by Patrice Kunst. And last but not least, congratulations on the on the baby. And as Samina mentioned before, when talking about having a new baby in the family, do make sure that even after the, the new baby is here, you do give um, your daughter, your 2.5 year old, lots of undivided attention as well. Thank you so much. And we will now have Samina answer one last question. Thank you, Carol. Oh, that was a lot of lovely advice for um, separation anxiety. Yes, it is a phase also in children. And surely, uh, as a mom, please be reassured that it will be over. Uh, my last question, and in fact, our last question on this tricky Thursday is from Suzanne. And she's asked, my two-year-old does not like to touch anything messy or get his fingers dirty. He gets it from me. How can I change this? Oh, Suzanne, thank you for being very honest here. And uh, well, let me see, how can I help you? And uh, let's talk about uh, toddlers. And uh, I'm sure as a mom, you agree, you would agree that toddlers often mimic of what their parents are doing. So if you're always tidying up after your toddler or pulling sad faces at a mess while um, uh, praising your child when he cleans up after himself, he's more likely to model the behavior himself. And which is not bad. Uh, however, how can you get him to touch messy things? Uh, it might be helpful to first take a look at how toddlers learn about the world around them within the first few years of life. Uh, toddlers are naturally driven by their tactile senses and explore the world, world around them with their sense of touch. They touch, 
they feel and explore objects within their reach. And this may help them understand more about their environment. Um, the fingertips, the lips, the tongue just so happens to house more sensory receptors for your toddler than any other region in the entire body. If your child is avoiding messy play, you will need to be sensitive about it and take it slowly uh, to give him a chance to gently explore sensations that he currently finds uncomfortable. Uh, you need to show your toddler that messy, sticky things can be fun playing with uh, when you play with them yourself. I know you don't want that, but you would have to give it a go. You would have to try. Uh, this is really important as toddlers gauge uh, the threat by how you respond as their parent. It's called social referencing and they do it for every single thing. Uh, they get their cues from you. Uh, when you are showing your toddler how safe and fun messy play can be, be gentle and expose uh, him to relatively controlled experiences such as uh, painting with a sponge or uh, rather than painting with the fingers because it can be overwhelming if he's never used his fingers before. At least then there's a, uh, there's a medium between his hands and the paper or uh, the texture where what she's using. Uh, over, uh, or um, let him play with bubbles in the bath rather than slime straight away. Uh, over the weeks and months, uh, your toddler would gently learn that messy play is safe and uh, you know, get used to getting his hands dirty. That doesn't mean that he will become, uh, that messy play will become his favorite activity, uh, as some toddlers like it more and others uh, like to, you know, uh, help themselves or take a little time to explore textures and, uh, and do it at their own speed and um, respect that. Um, uh, also what you need to do is show your toddler that being messy is okay and being messy uh, is okay in everything that you do. Um, it is very crucial as part of play and child development. A child who's never been exposed to messy textures in nature can become overly sensitive to tactile information. Uh, and I'm sure you are well aware that the children, these children will cry or scream if they get their hands or faces messy or will refuse to talk in, uh, uh, or refuse or refuse to talk or, um, uh, or become upset. And if this experience is given to them, or even um, when you're walking in the uh, garden or a park, um, they would not walk barefoot with, a, uh, with sand and grass being worried that it'll get onto their feet. Also, some children have the ability to explore more and their reactions to tactile sensation are just a reflection of their personality. Uh, some toddlers have a greater degree of behavioral inhibitions in their temperament when it comes to um, you know, really novel situations or new sensations that you're introducing them and may take a little longer to uh, get used to new things. But honestly, that is okay. Give them time and surely they will over a period of time and slow exposure uh, get around using it. Uh, the more textures that are allowed to be explored with their hands uh, and feet too, the more broader the children's understanding of different textures is and the more they are likely to use these textures in their mouth and their food uh, as food. Um, so you can also help name different textures to your children. You could say the mushy, crunchy, lumpy. Uh, keep in mind, the exposure should be gradual and tailored to your child's response. And I'm sure once you get your hands dirty, your child uh, will follow suit. And I hope I've answered your question and I've provided you a few tips and tricks to help overcome uh, this little obstacle in your child's journey uh, in life. This, with this, we have come to our end of our Tricky Thursday session. Uh, on behalf of Jumeirah International Nurseries, I would like to thank you for attending our second Tricky Thursday session and for sending us all your questions. Uh, we hope that this session has been helpful and we have answered your questions and provided you the understanding needed to support your beautiful children. Before we say goodbye, I would like to thank our moderators who are hiding in the background, Christina, Regine, and Mohammed, and to my co-panelists, 
Laura and Carol have been making happy Thursdays. We will be back next month with our third Tricky Thursday session with a different team of panelists and continue to support you in developing holistic, competent learners. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon and a weekend.